So good evening, everyone, here in the Old Theater at the Liberated Zone, watching us live from the Palestine Solidarity Encampment at LSE. And warm greetings also to our audience around the world tuning in online. Uh, my name is Aisha Chubukchu. I'm an associate professor in human rights at the Department of Sociology and the co-director of LSE Human Rights here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the school and an honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Christina Heatherton. Now, uh, as people are walking in, and before I proceed further, please allow me to thank Laura Wayne, Maddie Giles, and the LSE events team for all their work in making this event logistically possible. Uh, this evening, we gather together for the 10th annual Internationalism, Cosmopolitanism, and the Politics of Solidarity lecture series, which was inaugurated in 2014 by Professor Partho Chatterjee of Columbia University. Our speakers over the past decade have included Professors Susan Buck Morse, Etienne Balibar, Gayatri Spivak, Samuel Moyne, Sandro Mezadra, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, Gary Wilder, and Robin D.G. Kelly. I'm grateful to them all for bringing this lecture series to life over the past decade. Now, as we look towards the future, we're thrilled to be hosting Dr. Christina Heatherton tonight. Let me introduce her briefly. Dr. Heatherton is a scholar of internationalism, social movements, and critical theory. She is the Elting Associate Professor of American Studies and Human Rights at Trinity College in Connecticut, United States, where she is also Director of the American Studies Program, the Director of Graduate Studies, and the founding co-director of the Social Justice Institute. Dr. Heatherton is the author of the award-winning book, Arise, Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution, which was published by University of California Press in 2022. With Jordan Kemp, who is also with us tonight, she is also the co-editor of Freedom Now, Struggles for the Human Right to Housing in LA and Beyond, which was published by Freedom Now Books in 2012, and also the co-editor, also with Jordan Kemp, of Policing the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter, which was published by Verso in 2016. Dr. Heatherton's work has appeared in scholarly journals such as American Quarterly, Society and Space, City, Women's Studies Quarterly, Social Justice, and Interface. Her writing has also appeared in popular venues such as Public Seminar, Politics and Letters, Zocalo, and The Washington Spectator. Dr. Heatherton previously founded and co-directed several public-facing initiatives, including New Directions in American Studies, the Oral History and Activism Project, and the Working Group on Racial Capitalism, a project of the Center for the Study of Social Difference at Columbia University. Currently, Dr. Heatherton is the co-host and co-producer of the popular podcast, Conjuncture, as well. Dr. Heatherton's lecture tonight is titled Shadows Without Bodies, War, Revolutionary Nostalgia, and the Challenges of Internationalism. Extending the analysis in her book, Arise, Global Radicalism in the Era of the Mexican Revolution, this evening, Dr. Heatherton will consider how war, nationalism, and revolutionary nostalgia have confounded the development of an internationalist consciousness. In revisiting the radical theories and visions developed in an earlier era of global solidarity, this evening she will consider how we might imagine otherwise today. Dr. Heatherton's lecture tonight will last for about 45 minutes, and then I'll take questions from the audience, both in person and online. The event will conclude at 8 p.m. Um, 
I should note finally that we're being audio and video recorded. Time. I want to start off by thanking Aicha, Laura, and all the people who made tonight's talk possible. Uh, I want to give special thanks to Aicha for her extraordinary political clarity, particularly over these past seven months. Uh, it's been an honor to be in dialogue with her tonight and earlier when we spoke together at the student encampment. Um, above all, I want to thank all the protesting students, uh, both here at LSC and internationally, who have defined this moment to speak into. From Palestine to the Pacific Islands, from London to Hiroshima, from Trinity College in Dublin to Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, the students of the world are galvanizing global opposition to this slaughter. Any conversation that we can have about internationalism comes in the wake of their profound and resolute solidarity with Palestine. The students at this moment are our teachers. They are redefining the terms of politics. In the poet W.S. Merwin's words, they are refusing to make fire their only future or death their only star. If there is life for Gaza, if there is life in our future, it will come alongside these young people who are rejecting the murderous settlements of the present as either acceptable or inevitable. We speak in a time of unforgivable violence and against deliberate and unforgivable attempts at obfuscation. I've titled tonight's talk, Shadows Without Bodies, to reflect how we in the West are taught to believe that the war against Palestinians is not really a war, but a regrettable, though forgivable matter of collateral damage. Partially, I want to name the deaths with no reference, the murders that occur in the extreme passive tense, those killed without perpetrators. Hisham Awatani, a Palestinian student from Brown University in the US who was shot and severely wounded in Vermont this past fall, alongside his friends Kanan Abdelhamid of Haverford College and Tassin Ali Ahmed, our student from Trinity College, described the discordance of Palestinian life in this past Sunday's New York Times. Hisham writes, quote, in the news, our militancy is presumed, our killers unnamed, and our deaths repackaged into statistics. Somehow, we die without being killed. Hisham is now paralyzed from that attack, and I want to say that I stand with him, his friends, and his family. Needless to say, the suffering of the past seven months beggars the mind. An untold number have died in Gaza, and tens of thousands more will die or be permanently injured due to forced displacement and the destruction of basic infrastructure. Epidemiologists quoted in the Israeli paper Haaretz estimate that the number may reach as high as 120,000 deaths. In the West Bank, settlers have intensified their violent theft of land, distributing leaflets that say, wait for the great Nakba. From Gaza, journalist Ahmed Abu Arma reports that, quote, what we are seeing now is the continuation of the Nakba, but there is one difference. The Nakba today is being recorded by video and by voice all the world is watching. While the world condemns this genocide, we in the West are told by our leaders not to believe what we are seeing. The willing ignorance of empire has never looked so pathetic. Children, as we know, have been disproportionate targets. According to UNICEF, a thousand children in Gaza have had one or both legs amputated. And with the annihilation of health infrastructure, children can't receive first aid or basic pain management. This targeting continues a long-standing practice that Palestinian scholar, scholar Nadira Shalub Kevorkian describes as unchilding, the eviction of Palestinian children from childhood. Indeed, this genocide has required the invocation of new terminology. Two months in, medical practitioners had to invent a new acronym to name the injured, treating, uh, injured children they were treating. WCNSF stands for wounded child, no surviving family, since complete generations of Palestinian families have been totally or nearly eviscerated. With over 70% of all homes damaged or destroyed in Gaza, mainstream uh, outlets uh, like the US's National Public Radio have reported this as a domicide, the systematic destruction of homes. With schools, museums, archives, and libraries destroyed, and with every university in Gaza bombed, scholars are warning of an epistemicide the destruction of knowledge systems, and the knowledge they generate. Palestinian students recognize that this attack is both spatial and temporal. A viral tweet notes, quote, 
They blow up schools. They blow up universities. They blow up our future. This moment has illuminated how people can make peace with a brutal present by living in an idealized past or in a redeemed future. Of course, those of us who study policing recognize how temporal assertions are always simultaneously spatial imaginaries. How one understands themselves in time can determine how they move through space and vice versa. For states to reconcile the lived present with an aspirational future, great violence, along with the threat of it, is often deployed to bridge the distance. In this way, states, their security forces, and their ideologues do not simply operate in a future tense, imagining how things will be. They function in a subjunctive tense, declaring how things ought to be, an aspirational order unrealizable in the present world. They become arbiters of an order to be realized, guardians against activity that could become illegal, and protectors of populations deemed to be the legitimate occupants of space. The UN Permanent Observer for Palestine recently remarked that the entire civilian population and civilian infrastructure in Gaza have been rendered legitimate targets. This targeting has been possible because of the already existing occupation. As the Palestinian poet and professor Rafat al arir noted long before the current massacre, the targeting of the Israeli military is always largely arbitrary. In a June 2023 article, he explained that the conviction rate for Palestinian detainees was 99.74%. So if you are born Palestinian, you are guilty by association. This context of everyday repression, he explained to Time magazine in late 2023, was essential for understanding the underlying conditions of the war. Quote, it is necessary for people to understand what's going on beyond the genocide, beyond the bombs, beyond the massacre. So the questions before us tonight are multiple. How do we make sense of this moment in time? How do we make sense of time in this moment in history? How do we think about security and distinguish the spectacular from the everyday? How do we reckon with the challenges of war, revolutionary nostalgia to build an internationalism at present? So to answer these questions, I'd like to begin by telling you a story. Actually, I'd like to begin by taking a sip of water, and then I'll tell you a story. There was once a shepherd who loved gazing at the moon. So young and handsome, the moon loved gazing back at him. In Greek mythology, the shepherd Endymion was granted eternal life by the goddess of the moon, but perhaps granted is the wrong word for it. The young shepherd was frozen in the beauty of his youth, his life arrested at the moment of his captor's captivation. Every night, the moon would come to visit him in a cave. She would gaze upon him as he slept in a trance, eyes wide open. In Keats's 1818 poem, Endymion is a tragic figure, living in an uncertain time, face turned to the stars, reliving his life as a dream within a dream. He is both blessed and plagued by waking sight. Quote, I became loath and fearful to alight from such high soaring by a downward glance, so kept me steadfast in that airy trance. The recurrent theme of eternal life, Rafat al tells us in one of his lectures, was a persistent theme for Keats, a poet like al who died tragically young, for many reasons, this story has haunted my thinking. In the 1916 short story, Endymion or On the Border, the radical journalist and internationalist John Reed places Endymion in the border town of Presidio, Texas during the Mexican Revolution. In Reed's semi-fictionalized story, Endymion is an enigma, a stumbling, hiccuping drunk who is also a beloved German doctor healing Mexican people along the border. His words are garbled, but he sometimes flies into startling bursts of coherence, remembering fragments of a past life. Sometimes he picks up an instrument and plays heart-stoppingly beautiful music. Reed's protagonist is fascinated. He catches stray phrases and allusions and wonders if this man had also been a young radical when he found his way to Mexico. Quote, he himself seemed to have forgotten his past, right, writes Reed, lamenting these blear-eyed fragments. How do you locate a man who seems to belong to different registers of time, 
awake, but in a dream. It was this story, rather than Reed's other works, like 10 Days That Shook the World, that came to mind for today's lecture. Endymion seems to embody the challenges of internationalism, particularly the simultaneity of blindness and sight. I think about Reed's other works of fiction in Mexico in a new book that I just mentioned. Arise is a study of internationalism, a recognition of the ways that people have been unevenly waylaid by the global capitalist system and how they develop forms of revolutionary solidarity in spite of social and spatial divisions, including national borders. The book takes its title from the first word of the Internationale, the definitive anthem to internationalism. Arise, you prisoners of starvation, the song begins. In this way, Arise self-consciously joins a tradition of authors who have plumbed the lyrics to grapple with the legacy of internationalism in their own times. Franz Fanon famously took the second line of the song, Arise, ye wretched of the earth, to title his indictment of colonialism in and beyond French Algeria. After she left the Communist Party, Dorothy Healy wanted to title her memoir, Tradition's Chains Have Bound Us, a slight reconfiguration of the lyrics, No More Tradition's Chains Shall Bind Us. Healy argued that unless a radical tradition was, quote, able to constantly keep alive that challenging, questioning, and probing of the real scene around it, it would only be a mere shadow of itself, a snare of revolutionary nostalgia where hope is trapped and strangled, rather than a living, breathing tradition that might allow us to survive. This is perhaps the central lesson of my book. As Fanon reminds us, it is the responsibility of every generation to discover its revolutionary mission and fulfill or betray it. This means confronting the world before us as it is, not as we would like it to be. Following radical thinkers like Fanon and Healy, this means finding honest ways to define our moment on its own terms, not as a shadow or imitation of a previous revolutionary struggle. What do I mean by this? It's often tempting to speak of 1848, 1917, or 1968 as if our present moment is merely an extension of these previous eras. It is further tempting to speak as though the radical heroes of those times can be implotted into our own, their insights about earlier moments ventriloquized. In the uncertainty of our own time, glutted as it is with radical nostalgia, revolutionary heroes of the past seem to be tapped for an otherwise unavailable moral authority. But in invoking histories of past movements, our imaginations can often get trapped in anachronism, believing they were always becoming the thing they ultimately became. We can assign coherence to movements that they may not have actually possessed and find ourselves deficient in the process. As I've written elsewhere, nostalgia often reveals less about the era it recalls and more about the longings of the moment in which it is invoked. To confront this nostalgia and this undercurrent of deficiency, I emphasize the open and contingent process of making. This is reflected in uh, chapter titles like How to Make a Flag, How to Make Love, How to Make a Dress. The making for me is a challenge to revolutionary nostalgia. It emphasizes how political traditions are continually evolving and intersecting and how the chaos of the global capitalist system has always produced unanticipated alliances and therefore new theories of change. Internationalism, I argue, is a practice that is collectively forged and never simply found. To forge it at present means critically engaging the radical traditions we find we have inherited while also adopting the methods adequate to its comprehension. In my own work and in my collaborations with Jordan T. Camp, I understand the accumulation of crises that are simultaneously erupting as a conjuncture, which I would like to discuss tonight. Conjunctural analysis comes, as much left analysis does, out of defeat. But it is motivated by the belief that defeat is not inevitable. From thinkers like Marx, Engels, and Antonio Gramsci, it interrogates the blinding seductions of nostalgia. Conjunctures are not slices of time, but crystallizations of nonlinear crises, unsynchronized histories, as Mike Davis described, where colliding temporalities come to a head. To make the case more plainly, Arun Kudnani has recently analyzed the colliding temporalities of the Israeli state, which promotes itself as an incubator of hypermodern technological innovation, 
a leader in sectors of surveillance, weaponry, and security, in short, a bastion of the future. At the same time, he describes its invocation of 19th century settler colonial tropes to legitimate war, military occupation, and extreme forms of spatial control. Recent declarations from Israeli state officials that describe Palestinians as human animals or as barbarians have only underscored his insights. A conjuncture can be a haunted thing, heavy with resurrected, mem uh, with resurrected meanings, fantasies projected onto the dead, willful blindness, or as Marx writes in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, shadows that have lost their bodies. The Brumaire is a key inspiration for conjunctural analysis. The text examines the 1851 coup where Louis Bonaparte, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, established an authoritarian dictatorship in France with some forces of the crown, church, and fractions of finance capital aligning behind him. To break the power amassed by working class socialists after 1848, this bloc drew upon their collective strengths. They also organized a brutal counter-revolution to violently suppress working class dissent using the coercive powers of the law, the military, state surveillance, and a modern police force. But the text is famously about memory, nostalgia, and haunting. Louis anointed himself emperor of France's so-called Second Empire on the anniversary of his uncle's coronation, imitating the pageantry of Napoleon's reign while wearing old imperial robes. Louis aspired in vain to his uncle's stature. His rule was a caricature, or in Marx's often cited depictions, a farce. Shortly after the coup, Engels wrote to Marx, and possibly my favorite quote from them, could anything funnier be imagined than this travesty of the 18th Brumaire carried out by the most insignificant man in the whole world? It's like, sounds like text I sent, so. Uh, the Brumaire describes Louis' efforts to recreate the costumes of the past, along with its borrowed language and battle slogans, drawing on the legitimacy of earlier moments to conjure the, quote, dead of world history. Louis' order tied itself to past dynasties while cloaking itself in the mantle of the people. This combination of nostalgia, security, and imperial expansion charmed many. The threats of detention, surveillance, and prison coerced many more. Proletarian leaders at the time failed to fully assess the situation. They could not overcome the comforting seductions offered by this new power bloc, nor the coercive fears orchestrated by the counter-revolution. With the Brumaire, Marx tried to make sense of this failure. But while the Brumaire is a reassessment of the nostalgia invoked by a reactionary regime, it emerges out of a critique by Marx and Engels of their own nostalgia. Reflecting in 1895, Engels described how he and Marx were initially ill-equipped to understand Louis' machinations since they were both, quote, under the spell of previous historical experiences, namely the French Revolution. For us, he writes, quote, there could be no doubt that the great decisive struggle had broken out and that it could only end with the final victory of the proletariat. After all, Marx and Engels had correctly predicted in the Communist Manifesto that a consolidating working class would assert its power across the continent. What they had not anticipated was how formidable the bourgeoisie would become. Though bourgeois revolutions had proved weak up until the mid-19th century, the bourgeois counter-revolutions, in Angela Zimmerman's words, were, quote, terribly effective. As Engels reflected, we too have been shown to have been wrong by history, which has revealed our point of view at that time to have been an illusion. Marx's 18th Brumaire is therefore as much a reckoning with the events in France as it is a self-critical reflection on the development of radical theory in history. It defines histories of bourgeois revolution as romanticized, appearing to quote, storm swiftly from success to success. These he distinguishes from histories of proletarian revolutions, which by contrast had to, quote, criticize themselves constantly in order to reassess situations. He therefore proffers a radical orientation of humility as necessary to, con to concretely analyze conjunctures as they unfolded in unpredictable ways. 
Conjunctures, according to the geographer Stefan Kipfer, are confluences of distinct but intertwined temporalities. In his read, they also require specifically spatio-historic frames to comprehend. So to understand the spatio-historic frame of the text, it is worth briefly expanding the Brumaire's analysis beyond France and into its tragic imperial forays. Louis farcically reenacted his uncle's territorial ambitions, albeit under a distinct form of geoeconomic expansion. He sent French troops to New Caledonia, Algeria, China, Senegal, and Lebanon. He sympathized with the slaveholding Confederacy during the US Civil War. He sought territory in Latin America, including a major footprint in Mexico. In 1861, Mexican President Benito Juarez declared a moratorium on servicing foreign debts. Ostensibly enraged, Luis sent troops to recover the funds in 1862. Compared to other foreign bondholders, France's share of the debt was relatively small, hardly enough to justify an invasion. But unswayed, Louis installed Austrian Archduke Ferdinand Maximilian von Habsburg and his Belgian wife Carlotta, who was the daughter of King Leopold I, as the emperor and empress of Mexico in 1864. They arrived at Veracruz with an embarrassment of gilded finery, coaches, gold plates, crowns, enacting their own imperial farce. When Maximilian was executed by Mexican forces in 1867, the robes of the fantasy French empire fell, exposing a sad charade of the ancient regime. The spectacle of Maximilian's assassination was so humiliating to the French state that Louis made depictions of it illegal. One smuggled eyewitness account published in Le Figaro in August uh, 1867 describes the execution and names the existence of four photographs, one of Maximilian before his death, one of the execution squad, and two of Maximilian's clothing, his frock coat and waistcoat riddled with bullet holes. What you'll see on the poster for this talk are the photo negatives of these pictures. These images of death without Maximilian's body circulated widely and illegally throughout France. Allegedly, they informed the paintings of the event by Edward Manet, whose exhibition was uh, censored by Louis Napoleon. After the artist's death, Manet's son cut the main painting into pieces and sold them off. It was restored appropriately, I think, and fragments. What are apparent in Manet's depictions are the intimate details, tufts of hair coming out from the soldiers' hats, Maximilian's hand embracing his aides as the bullets are fired. These images are haunting reminders of that which was not meant to be shown. They were humiliating to the French state precisely because they were so humanizing. The shadows without bodies are depictions of loss that evade censorship the weakness of empire revealed through its dishonored fragments. The ongoing relevance of the Brumaire is in its concrete analysis of constituent elements of power. In his journalism of the period, Marx names the competing factions of the capitalist class, including the industrial bourgeoisie, the landed aristocracy, and the particularly vile faction he calls the lumpen bourgeoisie. The lumpen bourgeoisie are the no-account speculators, the rakes of the nobility, the men of low morals who were loathsome even by the standards of the day. This faction of the finance aristocracy did not represent elements of finance capital integral to the economy. They were the, quote, vultures and raiders who swing from speculation to swindling. They were capitalists who did not gain their wealth by production but as parasites feeding upon the extra-legal protrusions from the body social of the rich. House Draper has described how the state under Louis Napoleon was intended as a protection racket to skim off the fact for himself and his lumpen entourage. In this way, Marx helps us understand what Antonio Gramsci would later discuss as a historic block, a composite of distinct class and social forces that cohere around a common interest joined politically and culturally under a specific form of hegemony. Such an analysis recognizes that there is no singular class that can move politics forward alone. It also observes that within classes, most importantly among the capitalist class, there are fractions whose interests diverge. 
Unsteady blocks may be formed among strange bedfellows with otherwise contradictory interests. Conjunctural analysis seeks to understand how these blocks congeal, how their ascendancy is secured, and how popular support is amassed within them. And it does so with an underlying sense of contingency. It looks for ruptures and contradictions to figure out how alliances can be undone or remade. There is something specifically vile about the class of lumpen bourgeoisie today that often falls out of our analysis of the conjuncture. As the labor organizer Jane McAlevey recently described uh, as she is currently in hospice care, our fight today is, quote, against what has become a rapacious, vicious new gilded age elite whose predatory nature is nothing less than despicable, not to mention criminal. In today's world, these are the vultures of the economy, the slumlords, the nursing home flippers, the Italian cab company owners. Those might be the easiest to identify. They are also the short sellers, the junior hedge fund managers, the private equity pirates, the financiers who make nothing for themselves but who trap people in debt. While many commentators, especially in the US, focus on an apocryphal white working class as the heart of political reaction, this enraged, embittered, and entitled, slightly sidelined faction of the economy are at its true center. They are the ascendant class fraction who carry the rage of the, overlook, of the overlooked. Uh, or to quote our famous philosopher and former baseball manager Yogi Berra, second place is first loser. That's a joke. Uh, so who are the members of this class? In my work on policing, I've thought extensively about Rudolf Giuliani's extraordinary fall from grace as he has traveled the world trying to sell his wares as a so-called security expert. More recently, I've been thinking of President Trump's daughter, Ivanka, whose family for generations has been invested in predatory housing uh, relations in New York. Her husband, Jared Kushner, has come to renewed attention for his crude remarks, speculating on Gaza's, quote, very valuable waterfront property, along with his suggestion that Israel should remove Palestinian civilians to, quote, clean up the strip for development. Uh, this is in keeping with the uh, sources of Kushner's wealth. He made part of his fortune out uh, as a slumlord. His property management company recently paid out over $3 million to the state of Maryland for its scandalous housing conditions and punitive debt practices uh, that made residents pay for uninhabitable units riddled with pests and sewage leakages. Kushner and Ivanka have invested in a number of ventures, including properties in New York, and they have transferred their entanglements with militarism into Kushner's new Allied Partners investment firm, a company funded mostly through Saudi Arabian, Qatarian, and, uh, and United Arab Emirate government wealth funds, as well as investments from Israeli debt financing firms uh, and investments from the founder of Foxconn, the Taiwan-based electronics manufacturer infamous for placing suicide nets around its uh, factories, who is also a big investor in, in Israeli drones. While this lumpen bourgeoisie is not necessarily in control of state power, they derive their wealth parasitically from it. As in the time of the Brumaire, they also represent an ascendant faction of capital. Importantly, some of the global investors in this class self-style as anti-imperialist third world revolutionaries, even as they invest in war, even as they party with Jared and Ivanka. As anthropologist Fadi Bardawell writes, there is danger in simply reclaiming, quote, those leftists' older languages of emancipation or fetishizing an era of internationalist solidarity as if the intervening years between then and now have nothing to teach us. He writes, in particular conjunctures, theory may be appropriated, transfigured, and embedded in various political projects, endowing it with an ideological force and authorizing practice. While Franz Fanon is regularly invoked in our moment, his insights about colonialism often overshadow his remarks about the development of a neo-colonial order, the comprador bourgeoisie, those who appear to speak for the oppressed and colonized who only seek to enfranchise themselves while raising the correct flags and speaking words of liberation. Sarah Solemn draws upon Fanon to define this class as being structurally and fundamentally created to be dependent. 
She writes, decolonization did not always succeed in its stated goal of interrupting colonial structures and forms of dependency. Instead, it often merely transformed those structures to a native class. This has been echoed throughout the history of anti-colonial struggle. Irish internationalist James Connolly famously wrote in 1897, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. An analysis of global capital and its factions is therefore critical in our moment. So what does this all have to do with solidarity and internationalism? Well, when we think about forms of global solidarity emerging between places, we in the US often focus on the commonality of weapons and tactics that are used against different populations. US organizers have protested the exchange of weapons and technology between the Israeli military and US police forces. They have recognized, as Anthony Lowenstein describes in the Palestine Laboratory, how technologies of repression, surveillance, and occupation are quote unquote battle tested against Palestinian civilians. Abolitionist groups like Critical Resistance have been central to opposing militarized police trainings and weapons expos like Urban Shield in California. Cop City organizers in Atlanta are currently fighting the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, a university-based police exchange program with the IDF. Organizers have protested taxpayer-funded delegations of US police forces to Israel. As members of San Diego's Racial Justice Coalition recently noted, quote, knee on neck restraints like those that killed George Floyd are regularly applied to Palestinian populations. I want to dwell here for a second on the knee. Sometimes when we think about global warfare and racist police violence in the US, we tend to emphasize the spectacular. As organizers against racist state violence have repeatedly encouraged us to understand, the violence of policing is stunningly prosaic. Eric Garner was killed by a chokehold. Breonna Taylor by a service weapon. George Floyd was suffocated beneath a knee. The problem isn't the spectacularization of force, but the more mundane authorization to use it. Sometimes in the process of agitating against violence, we can make it seem more powerful, more coherent, and more sophisticated than it actually is. Rafat al made this point repeatedly in his writings, such as his edited book called Gaza Writes Back, and in his university lectures from Gaza, which are available on YouTube. Throughout his work, he describes the targeted violence of the occupation, he recalls in the intro a formative memory of seeing his childhood friend shot and killed by an Israeli soldier in front of his own house, not because the child had thrown stones at soldiers, but because the soldiers wanted to warn all the other children around him not to throw stones. He reflects on the calculations of the violence and how every bombing, every arrest, and every killing felt fraught with specified meaning from a seemingly all-knowing and all-powerful state. But he describes in one lecture being shocked to learn otherwise. In a poetry lecture, he describes the work of the Israeli group breaking the silence. They have collected the testimonies over, of over a thousand IDF soldiers, quote, to show the public an intimate and authentic picture of the daily routines of the occupation and the meaning of life under military rule. Instead of the calibrated actions of an all-knowing, powerful surveillance state, he reads instead about very young men and women encouraged to employ violence with brazen arbitrariness. Some simply decide to randomly bomb the third car in a convoy just because it's the third. Some describe bombing a house because they didn't like the exterior paint. He read, quote, we killed somebody because he was walking suspiciously. And then in the lecture, Rafat reflects, quote, for then a year, I was haunted by how I walked. Because what does it mean to walk suspiciously? Honestly, what does it mean? In place of cold calculations, these testimonies reveal the perhaps more frightening, daily, prosaic, and pointless violence of the occupation. There are, of course, many resonances with US policing. <clears throat> 
Working class communities in the U.S., particularly working class communities of color, certainly exist in a state of violent uncertainty as police are endowed with the arbitrary capacities to govern their existence. As we have seen in the most high profile incidents, police killings are often preceded by incessant harassment over small scale infractions like traffic violations or the sale of untaxed loose cigarettes. An outstanding ticket a person couldn't afford to pay the first time can become the pretext of their arrest on a subsequent stop. In such an environment, police can reasonably treat any person they choose as an arrestable suspect. In a volume I co-edited with LA uh, housing organizers, we describe criminalized behavior in the poorest parts of LA as including, quote, walking too slow, walking too fast, eating, standing. In other words, simply existing in space where one was an unwanted entity. My colleague, Diana Pollan, further describes policing along what she calls the neuro color line, noting how people of color and disproportionately black people in the United States who are neurodivergent, autistic, or non-neurotypical are frequent targets of police violence simply because of their inability to respond at the pace, volume, or in the manner of a neurotypical person. While there are significant differences between the military occupation in Palestine and racing, racist policing in the US, both targeted populations are vulnerable for arbitrary pretexts, including the fact that they may walk suspiciously. So while much attention is seemingly paid, is paid to seemingly new models of transnational policing exchanges, counterterrorism policing, or militarized policing, it is important to note that none of these forms were spun from whole cloth. They fortified already existing and legitimated forms of policing of very poor, disproportionately black, brown, indigenous, immigrant, and working class people in the United States. In a sense, they also represent the spatialized collision of multiple temporalities, colonial orders, Jim Crow regimes, imperial relations of war, and class struggle. These forms of policing are directly tied to the reorganization of space and the redirection of resources by capital processes that are legitimated through racism. This intense form of policing of crimes of poverty makes everyone, especially in mostly immigrant poor and working class neighborhoods, criminally suspect. Conjunctural analysis moves us away from the bewilderment of the spectacular and towards the necessity of political intervention. In this regard, the scholar Rhys McCold has repeatedly made the point that allies of the Palestinian struggle can sometimes unwittingly reproduce the propaganda of empire by asserting a legitimacy and an imaginary of state power that Israel would like to project, but that it doesn't, in fact, possess. This was made evident about two years ago when Mahmoud Arda and five other Palestinians escaped from Gilboa prison, Israel's most fortified prison, said to be more secure than the Bank of Israel. After tunneling out of Gilboa, using implements as small as tablespoons, Arda said he discovered a secret. Quote, we wanted to tell the world that this monster is nothing but an illusion of dust. This is a challenge of comprehending this conjuncture. How can we attest to securitize infrastructures with their world-destroying power while also recognizing that empires of violence can and often are simultaneously empires of dust. In another lecture about poetry and state power, Rafat reflects on his own knee-jerk reaction to discussing the power of poetry. When the state uh, arrests or persecutes cultural figures, especially poets, the refrain is usually, and he was only a poet. He explains that he, himself a poet, even found himself falling into the trap. But he explains that poets are not targeted incidentally because they do something useful but then happen to write poetry on the side. They are targeted precisely because they are poets. And as he describes, a poem can be as powerful as an entire army. Rafat, as I'm sure you all know, was killed in an Israeli airstrike this past December. He was 44 years old. Our analysis today is haunted by echoes, voices of the many killed. I want to add that there are voices of the many people who are unable to participate in these conversations 
Because, as Olafemi Taiwo notes, there are insincere gestures of inclusion that don't actually change the very elite nature of our conversations about racism and state violence. But I want to underscore that there are also voices of intellectuals who have been sidelined and marginalized. These are voices of people who have had their confidence crushed by the market or who are simply too overworked to write an essay, contribute a reflection, write a poem. With nearly 80% of the professoriate in the US being precarious, working in contingent, vulnerable, short-term, and underpaid positions with little to no research support, radical intellectual production is embattled. As we see with current congressional hearings, the unleashing of police on student protesters and against faculty, the current situation around political expression and intellectual production is dire. These circumstances have conservatized already conservative fields. They have conditioned scholars to be even more risk averse than many already are. But if we are able to speak to this conjuncture, to securitization, to racist policing, or to the question of Palestine at this moment in any meaningful way, it is because we are building upon the research and drawing upon the courage of scholars and intellectuals who have often been summarily dismissed from the profession for work that has been deemed too risky, too political, or too conjunctural, we might say. We suffer acutely from the absence of their sideline voices. I want to say that I previously taught at Barnard College, the women's college at Columbia University, and I have been watching the crackdown there with horror and concerns for friends and students. Some of that violence has similarly been pre-authorized by pre-existing security regimes. While I taught there, security guards assaulted a black Columbia student named Alexander McNabb, presuming he had no right to be on that campus, even after he showed his student ID. Students at the time were outraged. How many times, they wonder, had the same encounter been replicated with young black men and women from Harlem who didn't possess school IDs? The incident reflected Columbia's contentious relationship with the surrounding community. For every round of that school's growth and expansion, Harlem residents have suffered generations of intensified policing and painful displacement. These dynamics have perpetrated brutal segregation. They define who is able to live near the school, who is permitted to study within its walls, and who students are implicitly taught to respect and therefore disrespect as the authorized producers of knowledge. So when students at LSE and around the world reclaim space with their encampments, they are not only protesting the immediate conditions of war, but the histories of violence and exclusion that these institutions were built to reproduce. As many of you know, students at Columbia University renamed Alexander Hamilton Hall into Hind Hall after Hind Rajab, a six-year-old Palestinian girl who was killed in a gruesome bombing by the Israeli military. This was an enormously moving gesture. It was further meaningful to me because I was trained by people who had transformed that same Hamilton Hall into Malcolm X Hall during protests against the Vietnam War and against uh, segregation in Harlem. Those protests became their university. Those students understood then, just as students are understanding today, that they could claim the space of their education, and in the process, they could choose what kind of person they wanted to become through it. After all, colleges and universities not only train us with highly specialized skills, they also train us to understand the world and ourselves within it. But nothing is foregone. We can either reproduce the monstrous current order and imagine ourselves meekly within it, or we can follow the lead of these brave students and find ways to build the joyful, loving, empathetic, and peaceful world that we want now, a future in the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Is this microphone working, I wonder? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Christina, that was, that was a poem. <laughs> I, I know you're a poet, but that was a very thoughtful poem. Thank you very much. I have a, a one question to get us started, but I would like to encourage the audience 
to prepare their questions. Uh, I hope this can be a conversation with Dr. Heatherton. So uh, my question is about humility. You mentioned self-critique, Marx's exercise of self-critique and his encouragement uh, for revolutionary movements and uh, what we call the global left today to exercise self-critique, you added humility there. I wonder what kind of humility and self-critique you find necessary at this moment uh, in terms of imagining our connections around the world, imagining internationalism and solidarity in the 21st century. I know you're located in the United States. Uh, the first necessity of humility that comes to my mind is about decentering the United States as the center of the world, basically. But what did you have in mind? What kind of humility uh, are you asking us to practice in relation to internationalism today? Well, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I, I feel somewhat obliged to say that the correct answer is to decenter the United States first and foremost. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but I guess I'd add this too. So people are familiar with Gramsci. He is, if, if you're not, you're, you're likely familiar with his concept of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Mm -hmm. Yes? And in School of Economics? Okay. Yes. Well, there's this really interesting note in that passage where he talks about daydreams and the mm -hmm. kind of power and danger of daydreams. And he says something to the effect, don't quote me, that um, the, you know, daydreams are possible because they allow us to imagine things that aren't maybe not possible in the present. You know, the imagination is very powerful. But he says the reason that they can be dangerous is that they can, in, in essence, scratch the itch of the thing that we are trying to achieve. There are ways that we can um, almost create charades of our own of the power dynamics that we're trying to interact with. And in the process, he says, there's a distinction between doing the things that make us feel powerful versus building power. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think part of the reason I wanted to focus on revolutionary nostalgia so much is because I do feel like there's this kind of hollow importing, this way of um, thinking about past struggles and past revolutionary heroes as if in the ventriloquizing of their mm -hmm. words, as if drawing on their moments, it uh, substitutes for the strength that we can have on our own. I, you know, I'm very moved by Stuart Hall's concept of Marxism without guarantees, if only to be able to say that radical politics is very messy. It can be very unsatisfying, it can be very unfulfilling, and when you're engaged in any kind of political movement and you don't feel like you're about to win, you know, I, I, I feel like it, it's out of weakness that we can borrow you know, our poetry not from the future but from the past. And so the humility to simply address the situation before us, not to fall into what Gramsci talks about as daydreams, not to go someplace else that makes us feel strong, but trying to confront the situation as it is and build strength. Mm -hmm. um, I feel tempted to defend daydreams here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of daydreams. Um, yes, I, it made me think of Walter Benjamin's description of how how flowers turn oh, towards by the By dint sun. of a secret but heliotrope. Exactly, oh, God, by dint of started, a secret yes. <laughs> So to, I don't know if people are familiar with that passage from Walter Benjamin, but radical movements do turn to prior moments of inspiration. Um, I wonder if there is a particular kind of turning that can be redeemed and can be uh, can be used to enrich the dream world of our movements of a, a radical internationalism today. Is it all problematic to turn to revolutionary nostalgia? I'm not saying nostalgia is the answer, but there are certainly things we could, for example, learn from the uh, revolutionary thinkers and activists that you're writing about during the time of the Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder what exactly you see as the problem there, the borrowing, uh, the fact that this is a different historical conjuncture that necessitates a different type of politics? 
this borrowing of vocabularies. Let's, for example, take the vocabulary of liberation that is making a, a comeback today in relation mm -hmm. to Palestine. Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of re-signifying uh, the same concepts or oh. dropping them all together to come up with new uh, poetry of radical politics, a new vocabulary? Where do you stand in relation to this borrowing of vocabularies and the need to come up with new ones to imagine forms of new internationalism. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful and very difficult mm. question. I appreciate that very much. Mm. Um, so, you know, if I leave here and am seen as the disciplinarian of dreams and daydreams, I will have died a thousand deaths and I would be a total failure. So obviously I'm not trying to say that we need yes. to police dreaming and imagination or that there's a proper kind of borrowing from past movements. I mean, there's a reason I quote all the revolutionaries that I did. But as we spoke with the students from the encampment mm -hmm. today, right, the, the, the reason it's important to parse through the legacy of internationalism and part of the reason I think I start at a, uh, with the Mexican Revolution rather than the Res Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. is because I feel like sometimes our inheritance of internationalism in particular can feel so freighted, so mm -hmm. freighted in a way that it feels like um, it's somewhat predetermined. You are endowed with something that has been fully formed rather than a tradition that you see yourself mm -hmm. in the process of making. So, I mean, one thing that I, at this moment, I mean, I, I can't answer all your questions, but one mm -hmm. thing that I find maybe a juxtaposition that helps answer your question is that, uh, you know, we can fetishize 1917 quite a lot, I, you know, for good reasons and for bad. But I feel like one thing that I, I say in the book, in the chapter, mm -hmm. How to Make Love, mm -hmm. is I, I reemphasize that the third international that preceded the production of the communist international, that produced the tradition of internationalism that many of us inherit, was actually a part of a split that was fundamentally brokered by all these radical feminists, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Clara Zetkin, and as I mm -hmm. write about extensively in the book, Alexandra Kalantai. Uh, and I find that, you know, to not get into all the weeds here, but their opposition to the Second International's endorsement of the First World War, mm -hmm. their sense that there was nothing liberatory in having the working class of the world sign up to kill each other, right? Mm -hmm. Their invocation of the international, saying you cannot mesmerize us by gun smoke, right? Mm -hmm. their, their total rejection of the masculinist fantasies of militarism and nationalism, that's what produced the break to the third international. So that is certainly like a past struggle, mm -hmm. you know, that I see opening things up. That's a way of, of I don't want to say authorizing, that's the wrong word, mm -hmm. but it's the word that I have. Um, if I want to think about internationalism as an ongoing feminist struggle that continues to reject those things, that's, I think, a, a dynamic version of that history that doesn't feel like a freighted inheritance that's hard to move out mm -hmm. from underneath. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question, but I want to turn to the audience. OK, let me ask my follow-up <laughs> question. Uh, this is a question that I've been trying to work through for many years, and since we're having this conversation on record. <laughs> Let me ask if you think nationalism and internationalism are antithetical to each other, or if you think they have been historically complementary to each other. In particular, I have anti-colonial nationalism in mind in its complicated relationship to internationalism. So I could pose that question historically, but let's bring the question to today. How do we think about nationalism in relation to internationalism at this particular conjuncture with Palestine on our minds? I, 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 mm -hmm. I do want to think about, you preface a question saying this was something that you've thought quite a lot about, and there's you know, uh, a lot of different ways that people have dealt with this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the history, Chantal Bateman's internationalism mm -hmm. without nations, mm -hmm. for example, you know, ways mm -hmm. in which uh, anarchists have thought about the project of internationalism, either within, with, or against uh, different state parties. Um, but I'm curious if I could put it back to you. Mm -hmm. How does the current moment maybe... Uh, 
intensify the kind of questions that you've been asking about nationalism, internationalism, and anti-colonial nationalism? How does it intensify it? Um, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> it is. Um, well, for example, the question of an independent Palestinian state, what is the, when we say, okay, let me summarize it this way. When social movements, Palestine Solidarity Movement says, free Palestine, I'm very interested in the political imaginaries of that freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's how the question gets intensified for me now. And let me link it to your emphasis on state formation and policing and mm -hmm. securitization. So does freedom, this is the form it has assumed for me now, and we've had this prior conversation four mm -hmm. years ago, Princeton LSE co-production, yes. where I pose you the same question. So does freedom look like an independent nation state? And when we take that question to our contemporary current conjuncture, uh, it becomes intensified. That question becomes intensified. The nature of the internationalism we're imagining and the freedom uh, that uh, Palestine Solidarity Movement and Palestinian Liberation Movement demands. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is its relation to the nation state? Um, yes, that's. It's, it's, it's a very complicated question. I know. Fire back and forth here. Yes. Um, I mean, I I feel moved to just reaffirm. Uh, mm -hmm. I I. I very much appreciated your piece in the Boston Review that talked about the multiplicities mm -hmm. of forms of freedom struggle, and I thought that was absolutely right on. Uh, both, you know, in addressing your question, the way that you said we have to, uh, in solidarity, to mm -hmm. be in solidarity with Palestine is to understand there are multiple places yeah. from which people are struggling and imagining freedom, yes. uh, both in the kind of immediate and in the long term, and mm -hmm. that it is a mistake for anybody in the West to mm -hmm. presume a singularity yes. of that political struggle. I was like, no, that, that's a very difficult point to make, but I thought that that was absolutely right on. So, um, yes, that's, that's a great opening for us to continue the conversation because it takes us to the politics of solidarity, mm -hmm. the politics of international solidarity at this current conjuncture. Um, perhaps our audience members have thoughts, questions. Yes, please. If you don't mind introducing yourself briefly, that would be very much appreciated. The microphone is coming. Thank you. James Knight, member of the public. Um, mm -hmm. I've been wrestling for many years. We're talking about the Palestinian uh, problem. We use a better word. Has been around for many, many years, but uh, just come to hiatus now. I have always wrestled: How can you criticise the Israeli state and government and elite without seeming this is it? Anything you say is taken to be anti-Semitic. How do you distinguish between the Israeli state and mm -hmm. the Jewish religion and separate them, you know, in your criticisms kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I've wrestled for many years. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more question or comment, if there is any. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was kind of struck by this, your thoughts on like, how can we attest to the power of securitization without kind of, whilst also seeing that actually it's something that can be resisted. Um, and it also made me think of how a lot of that securitization is about kind of uh, prescribing resistance. Like a lot of terrorism is about prescribing political violence or even mm -hmm. just politics. And it, yeah, I'm kind of wonder like, how that's related and more like what your thoughts are on how how do we deal with that and i think there's also maybe an interesting strategic question of like when people say oh he was just a poet or just you know whatever like sometimes there's a can we use that strategically but that yeah i don't know if you have mm -hmm. thoughts on that kind of that question really so how can we okay 
you've heard the questions. Which one <laughs> would you like to take first? Well, I'll say first of mm -hmm. all that, you know, most of my friends, colleagues, comrades in the United States and around the world that are in the most intense solidarity with Palestine are not only Jewish, but many of them have connections, direct co uh, connections to Israel. So, you know, the most recent episode of Conjuncture that Jordan Camp and I did uh, in, is a, a talk by the amazing geographer Jillian Hart, who mm. is thinking about the apartheid analogy as somebody who's from uh, South Africa, who also, as she describes, grew up with Zionist parents who were quite powerful in the Zionist project. And so it's a really extraordinary reckoning with that. Of course, I'm sure you've all seen in the United States, you know, like uh, the pa Palestinian solidarity has been led by groups like Jewish Voices mm -hmm. for Peace, you know. I mean, there's always this fraudulent argument uh, when people, you know, I mean, Robin Kelly, as you know, mm -hmm. just did a, a really extraordinary overview of the protests at UCLA, where he takes to task this notion that protests are anti-Semitic, when he says, you know, when they led all these vigilantes, when the cops stood by and let all these vigilantes attack the student encampment there, like, you know, if, if not most, uh, quite a large percentage of those protesting were Jewish. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I mean, I understand that this is, uh, uh, to, to respond to the first question, that this is something that gets invoked quite often, this collapsing of, of a critique of the state of Israel mm -hmm. with Jewishness. But I just, in the Palestinian solidarity movements today, I, I don't actually see that conflation. It's not to say that there's mm -hmm. no anti-Semitism in the movement, but to presume that to be Jew Jewish means that you can't have a critique of the genocide of uh, the Israeli state's action, I, I think that that's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, there were a few questions yeah. in your questions, and I've already forgotten some of the questions, but I'll do my best. So I will just say that you know, my work's a little strange because I both write about histories of internationalism in the early 20th century, and then I do work with different organizers around racist state violence at present. But I do think that they go hand in hand because the tradition that I see myself a part of, the, a tradition of history from below, always teaches us to read things backwards, right? And so mm -hmm. when you think about how, we were just talking about this today at the encampment, right? When you think about the ways the, the state cracks down on political dissent, when you think about this ridiculousness, I don't know how much of the footage has reached you all in London, but you know, police shoving and pushing and you know, beating protesters, beating uh, onlookers, you know, like, this, uh, I, I think people understand, is both, like, has to be understood on its own terms for what kind of horrifying violence it is, but also to be read backwards, right? That it's a sign of its strength and effectiveness that the state has, has to resort to mm -hmm. unleashing this degree of physical violence as an attempt to staunch it. And then they fail, right? I mean, this is the, it, you know, part of my book looks at social movements in Los Angeles, uh, and so it's really interesting. There are memoirs that talk about the reason why people joined radical movements was often because they went to protests and saw how fiercely the Los Angeles Police Department beat protesters. And they were like, wait a second, that's totally wrong. Wait a second, maybe everything I think about the world is wrong. Wait a second, all of a sudden I'm marching with these people. You know, and I think increasingly that's where, uh, what we're seeing now. I think I heard one of, a student at the encampment talking about some of the response of the administration to the encampment and saying, look, on one hand, it's a little worrying. On the other hand, they must be nervous if they're trying to respond in the way they are. And I think holding that duality is really important, especially if you're going to try to keep going, mm -hmm. which you must. <laughs> Okay, I have uh, two questions here from our online audience. The first one uh, is from a student at Ambedkar University in Delhi. Uh, this student is asking, uh, do you think the rise of ethno-nationalism and the right push glorification of glorious pa past of state identity has affected uh, is creating wars across the world like Israel, Palestine, and Russia, and Ukraine. It's another question about the rise of nationalism all around the world and its effect 
on the wars we're witnessing. And the second question I would like to raise is from the United States. University students, the question says, are on campus for, for four years. Workers are at work all their lives. Have you come across successful examples of student worker alliances uh, that are internationalists? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So nationalism, <laughs> its role in facilitating wars, mm -hmm. and the question of student worker alliances in internationalist movements. Sure. Um, well, I, I suppose the first question harkens back to the first question you asked me about humility, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just about kind of taking the temperature of this moment. Because I feel mm -hmm. like the same kind of insecurity that, and, and it is insecurity, I talked mm -hmm. about it in the talk as deficiency, but the insecurity that allows people to not just borrow from past movements, but do a certain kind of cosplay, you know, very similar to what I'm describing, uh, mm -hmm. or what Marx describes with the Brumaire, I think that comes from a weakness. And I do think mm -hmm. that there's something absolutely forgivable about when people feel insecure, how you can move to the things that make you feel strong. Maybe that's what I meant mm -hmm. more about the daydreams. And I mention this because I think that in the rise of a fiercely masculinist, uh, nationalist, uh, ethno-nationalist, racist nationalist projects, you, you, you know, like perhaps it's easier to see the kind of like hollow embodiment of, you know, what feel like brave archetypes mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, to answer your question, um, what's the distinction between a kind of positive daydreaming, positive borrowing from the past and this kind of zombified form? You know, I think that that's a really, um, uh, good explanation to, to, to think instead about the masculinist rise of ethno-nationalist fantasies that we see all mm -hmm. around the world at this moment. So I don't remember the particular question that came from it, but I, I do think that, that our conversation about internationalism, the, the, the questions about why this is so important now, they're not just abstract, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just that I'm, you know, here to plug a a book, uh, but um, they are essential because if we do not develop a, a coherent alternative way of thinking about it, this is what is ascended. Yes. This is what is taking like libidinal force around the world. Uh, and yes, it is intensifying. I don't, this is improper to say, but everything that's wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes, so I agree that that's an issue. Um, and the second question. Student worker alliances. Yes. In I'm, internationalist movements. In internationalist movements. I mean, I mean there's a ton of examples mm -hmm. of that. You know, uh, I think I came of age uh, in an era where there was a lot of really fantastic solidarity. I mean, I came, we came of age yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> during a, a movement of uh, very well articulated anti globalization politics. And so, uh, worker struggles against what we called then sweatshops, mm -hmm. uh, you know, struggles that understood anti-globalization as uh, being in alignment with different uh, worker movements, whether they were in factories, whether they were peasant movements, mm -hmm. you know, like, I would say that the critical element of a lot of this is, uh, maybe I'll answer it this way, um, you know, Students have had a remarkable history of being in line with social movements. And I guess part of the critical element is for students to understand what kind of struggles are already happening, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the enormous power of organized labor around the world and how student movements, I mean, we talked about this again. We had such a great conversation at the encampment. I just keep yes. referring to it. <laughs> but how students can see themselves both in alignment with struggles that are already happening, that are internationalism, that they have direct bearing on, mm -hmm. but also how they can think very specifically about what they can do, where they are located to intervene, because that looks different in every place. Sometimes it's a question of investment, you know, that seems to be the thrust of the student movement here and on a lot of campuses. It's about divestment. 
But in other places, it is about knowledge production. Mm -hmm. These institutions are centers of knowledge production. What are you being taught about other places? What are you being taught about the availability of land, of labor, the extraction of raw materials? How are you being taught or not taught to think about people in those different places? This is as much a terrain of struggle as the, as the questions of like solidarity in terms of divestment. So I would just add that mm -hmm. as well. Thank you, Christina. Are there any reflections? Uh, yes, Sar. Hi, uh, I'm Sara Salem, working work here at LSE. Thank you so much for such a fantastic and really moving um, talk. I was thinking a lot about time and temporalities, especially when you talked about how colonial projects and state projects draw on different temporalities to legitimize mm -hmm. themselves, even in contradictory ways. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about how anti-colonialism also, in really interesting and important ways also has this temporal dimension because it's often represented as something that's drawing on the past and yet is almost always also about the future. So mm -hmm. even thinking about, you know, like things you'll hear like see you tomorrow in a free Palestine or these ideas of building a future and yet also seeing themselves as part of this lineage um, that's really important and thinking about the present. So I was wondering if you also see anti-colonial temporalities as something quite important to think about. And that nostalgia is there, but there are also these, there's speculative work that's happening. There's the, the imagination, the dreams. Mm -hmm. And also how in moments of revolution, time can kind of collapse all of a sudden. So I was thinking about the 2011 Egyptian revolution, how when you're in this space, Mm -hmm. um, the present just disappears in the sense that suddenly the past is there and the future is there at the same time. And, you know, so many, uh, even my parents that were there were suddenly feeling like, is this a chance to do something we didn't have the courage to do? And mm -hmm. so almost reaching back into the past to do something different. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was thinking a lot about this idea of is there something about anti-colonial temporalities that helps us think about how the past is really powerful, but that also there's always this attention to the future um, mm -hmm. that almost collapses some of these linear distinctions? Mm -hmm. um, Thank yeah. you. I'm taking notes. I'll take the rest <laughs> of the questions as time is getting short. Mahish? Yes, thank yes. you. So my name is Mavish. Uh, I also work here at LSE. Thank you for a really beautiful and inspiring talk, um, especially at a time when, of course, across the UK, people can sometimes not even speak of Palestine. Um, so um, the question, I hope it's going to make sense, but uh, my own work uh, is also on various forms of legalized militarized violence and anti-colonial left movements, but in another part of the world, which is South Asia and the Pakistan Afghanistan region. And one of the things when it comes to internationalism that I really struggle with, and mm -hmm. I think uh, potentially in some of the work that Aicha does in terms of Kurdish uh, movements uh, also comes up there, is how there's some struggles both in the past, when one looks back nostalgically, but also in the present that are more legible and visible than others, uh, that become sort of uh, symbols of what the internationalism is of the 21st century and of course mm -hmm. at the moment right now uh, at the same time as Palestine we have Sudan mm -hmm. uh, which recedes into the background very very quickly and uh, people struggle though wanting very desperately to create the modes of connection um, and solidarity there as well uh, struggle to create that and have Sudan emerge also up there at the same uh, level of legibility. And it's interesting that the hashtag online is eyes on Sudan, keep, mm -hmm. keep your eyes on Sudan. It's constantly receding into the background. Why is that happening? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, as far as I understand, Kurdish, you know, Kurdish movements really blow up into the scene when it becomes relevant within the geopolitics of US imperialism in terms of ISIS. That's when it suddenly goes from 
into a, a form of legibility, but mm -hmm. before that remains a domesticated issue that has nothing to do with elsewhere. And in, in the region that I work on has been Afghanistan for years mm -hmm. under US occupation with all of the conversations of decolonization in our universities. The fact that there was active US occupation in Afghanistan was barely on the radar of the conversation until the withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And then it was on there for two months and then out. Uh, so I was wondering if, you know, about that and some reflections upon that. And I think also referring back to something that I just said in the beginning about the decentering of the US mm -hmm. and perhaps also the decentering of US empire as that frame through which we mm -hmm. see or don't see struggles around the world mm -hmm. as connected to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'll take one. Oh, there are two more. I saw S Susie. Um, just to return, Susie, we met earlier, yes. um, and thank you for an exquisite talk. Um, just to return to Aisha's question about the nation, I wonder if there is a an imaginary we could provoke that's neither lodged between the idea of nationalism nor nationhood, mm -hmm. but is about a kind of scale of gathering that allows us to think about how we hold resources, how we distribute resources, how we think about neighborliness um, without just throwing that possibility away because of the disasters of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's one more. Do you have a question too? No, I see one more question and then Christina will have five minutes to <laughs> respond to everything. <laughs> Vidya, thank you. Hi, um, my name is uh, Vidya Kumar. I'm at Soas um, University. Um, so uh, I just want to follow up on Aicha's conversation with you um, because you know I'm I haven't finished it, but I've started to read this wonderful, absolutely beautiful book of yours, mm -hmm. and it seems like in the second chapter you actually do have an answer to her question about the tension between nationalism and internationalism, whereby you would reject nationalism as an answer to the liberation question. Um, and I just want to know whether or not your, your hesitancy to agree with that position suggests that um, um, it's <laughs> the question of nationalism within the Palestinian context is much more fraught, and nationalism being fetishized in part because of what international law has done to the state of, of Palestine, mm -hmm. um, which has created a, a, a kind of um, idea that the state, a state, is a solution. And so the legal language being brought in mm -hmm. and taking over the imaginative ways in which there could be a different kind of collective solution to, to um, the conflict, the question, and the oppression. So, I, I just would like to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on that. Um, um, and then um, the second question I had simply had to do with some of your um, arguments about the dangers of nostalgia or the bad kind of daydreaming mm. suggest to me that um, yeah. that um, it, sim there, there's similar arguments that David Scott makes in relation to omens of adversity and the Haitian mm -hmm. Revolution. And I know your. I'm, I was listening very carefully, and I know your analysis is different. And your, your. I'm just curious to where you depart, or what do you say, um, in in uh, in terms of either his work or um, the way you view those dangers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. These are such fantastic questions. Four of them. One minute each, please, <laughs> Christina. No problem. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, it's actually quite a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Sarah, first, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name like a bad American. Um, I, it's very difficult to address your question without just citing your own work back to you, which I, you know, I mean that as a big compliment. But I, I suppose in my now 30 seconds to respond, I, I my mind is searching through a lot of the anti-colonial resistance that I walk through my students with, and yet what's pushing against it, and it's probably Aicha's fault for bringing up Benjamin before, are some of mm. his insights, uh, you know, in One Race Street, he has this 
phenomenal description of the bourgeois interior that prefigures the detective novel. Mm -hmm. And he right, and he describes the like the Orientalism of the interior that could not but resolve into murder. And I mention it because as, as much as I do think, and, and there have been fantastic writings about the speculative imaginary of the anti-colonial, I, I think I'm kind of interested in the repressed memory of the colonizer and the sort of uh, stasis in time that that produces because I feel like it's that unwillingness to face up to uh, you know to colonial violence and disorder that produces its own kind of temporal dislocations and so in the same way as and I'm sorry tell me your name one more time Mavish Mavish as the same way as uh, that you underscored Aisha's point about decentering the U S um, I I am losing my point uh, try to tie it all together very neatly Afghanistan and Sudan why don't they Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel like they're I'm trying to say, I, I feel like this kind of, um, I don't want to think about anti-colonial time simply in response to colonial time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I, I think actually understanding its own dislocations and disorder gives, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the kind of insights about nostalgia and the, you know, endymion gazing at the stars and pretending that he's not where he is, is, is that's a reflection on that kind of repression. So the beginning of my response, had I seven minutes, you know, I could get into it. But I would say, of course, there's an anti-colonial speculative imaginary that's revolutionary that inhabits time in much different ways. But I feel like we have to contend with the repression of temporality that I think sets a lot of the clock mm -hmm. for how we think about some of these questions. I absolutely agree about like not just displacing, as I just said, uh, the U.S. from the center of these conversations or just U.S. empire. You know, I think it gives us a very jaundiced view of how we approach any of these questions. And I suppose like some of the humility that we talked about earlier does involve like saying, what is the situation at present and how do we approach it without these kind of prefigured paradigms that presume we know who the enemy is at all times, right? That every struggle resolves as a struggle against US imperialism as if US empire was that strong or singular. So mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate you bringing Sudan into the conversation. I appreciate you bringing Afghanistan into the conversation and uh, <laughs> I have like 30 seconds. So that I'm gonna mm -hmm. have to leave it there. Uh, Maybe we can tie to Susie's question about uh, nationalism and the possibility of going beyond it in our internationalist imagination. So I, I think, and mm -hmm. I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Vidya. Vidya, thank you both for your mm -hmm. questions very much. And I think this very, as you said, you listen very closely. I was almost gonna have to go back to chapter two and say, what did I write? Uh, <laughs> Um, but I think if I, if I do have hesitance to draw immediately from this text to the present moment, part of it is precisely because there's such different uh, contexts uh, and, and histories. And so to make a very long story short, which I have to, uh, I think there's such tension at this moment, right? I mean, I came to human rights. I was like, I can't believe they hired me in human rights. I'm like such a critic of human rights, right? Mm -hmm happens sometimes, right? It does. But yeah. at this moment, right, I mean, I think we are all dealing with this very productive tension of being able to say, how do you think about the available frameworks and their limitations when they are also, you know, the frameworks within which we can move? It is not insignificant when the ICC makes a declaration, right? It is not insignificant when UN special rapporteurs declare this a genocide. It is not insignificant when international bodies weigh in. And so how do you deal with the tension of something you have a critique of and mm -hmm. also have to negotiate within? And so mm -hmm. not to, com to, minim well, to minimize your question in 10 seconds, I feel mm -hmm. like you know, we are in this moment of mm -hmm. tension. And so the multiplicities that you talk about, mm -hmm. having to be alive to multiple possibilities, not being strident about there being one answer. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna survive this moment, we have to have that kind of flexibility, that mm -hmm. ability to move, the ability to think about what has been built before us mm -hmm. um, and what we can do. <laughs>
Thank you. On that note of being open to multiplicity of interpretations, imaginations, please join me in thanking Dr. Christina Hendricks.